If you haven't checked in yet, please do so in the ensign room just around the uh, side um, and sign in and pick up your materials. Um, and if you haven't registered, uh, please do so right away. You can also do that there. Um, if, if you're getting expenses reimbursed, please submit your voucher by tomorrow, Tuesday. Um, if you have any questions, please talk to Lori Malucci, uh, who is representing the MS here. Um, so on your voucher, you can also, in case we have extra money, there's no guarantee, but uh, you can request more than uh, what you were offered. Um, or if, even if it was zero, you can get a voucher and make a request. We may not have money, so, uh, but you can submit a request. Um, also, for the morning lectures, as you can see, it can be hard if you're in the back to see the slides. All the slides are online, uh, so if you have trouble seeing, you might want to pull out your tablet or laptop, and you can view the slides there. Let's see. Okay, and uh, the last uh, practical announcement is uh, there's no smoking, no drinking, no fireworks uh, on campus. <laughs> okay, and with that, uh, let me turn it over to Peter Scholze for our first talk uh, today on Pierre de Koch theory. All right, thank you. Uh, th thanks a lot for the invitation to speak here. It's a big honor. Um, so I want to speak about, so in the first lectures I want to speak about Pierre de Koch theory and in the little final talk I want to talk about some recent work in integral Pierre de Koch theory. Um, and I must say that I'm, <laughs> It's one of the first times I give a slides talk, and uh, I'm probably not so good at it. And um, I have the fear that I run out of slides too soon. <laughs> On the other hand, I have the feeling that there's way more material than I would be able to get through in a Blackboard talk. And so I guess what I should do is I should be very slow. So please help me with that by asking questions, etc. cetera. Um, all right, so this talk is about Pierre de Koch theory. And so let's first recall classical or complex Koch theory. Um, here's some compact, complex manifold, and I will discuss some examples on the next slide. And so then, the famous theorem of Hodge is that <coughs> if X admits a Kähler form, um, then there is a natural Hodge decomposition uh, taking, we take the singular cohomology of X, uh, which exists with integral coefficients, but I guess you only care about it with complex coefficients here. And then this is decomposed as direct sum over uh, cohomology groups of the differential form, so-called Hodge cohomology groups. Um, so the proof of this is uh, uh, some real analysis. So I guess what you do is you represent, um, I guess you, oops, uh, you uh, computes as the wrong cohomology, as we will say in a second, and then you use harmonic differential forms, um, which makes sense if you have a Kähler manifold, uh, to represent, you can uniquely represent all the cohomology classes. And on the other hand, <coughs> these harmonic representatives uh, can also be, some also uniquely represent cohomology classes of these differential forms. And putting these inputs together, these analytic inputs together, you get this algebraic consequence. Um, so there is a statement which is true much more generally without assuming it's cater, is that, and maybe also without assuming compactness, um, that there is an isomorphism between the singular cohomology groups if you extend scales to the complex numbers and the uh, Durham cohomology groups, say, defined as the hyper cohomology groups of the holomorphic Durham complex of X. And so this is uh, a consequence of the fact that if you look at the holomorphic Durand complex on any pulley disk, um, then it's exact and the const exact and positive degrees, and the only uh, horizontal functions are just the constant c. And so in particular, the proof of this uses crucially that a complex manifold is locally just some Holy disk. So the local structure of a complex manifold is extremely simple. It's locally contractible, etc. Also, this local contractibility of a manifold implies that <coughs> these cohomology groups, these singular cohomology groups, are finitely generated to be in groups, which vanish if i is larger than tw 
twice the complex dimension of X. Um, I'm saying these things because uh, in a second when I will switch to the periodic setup, they will not at all be true. <coughs> and so um, just these two isomorphisms taken together have another purely algebraic consequence, namely uh, that if X is K-less, that we can apply the first result, then the hodge durand spectral sequence, so it's a spectral sequence which converges from the hodge cohomology groups to the durand cohomology groups, and just comes from the fact that these durand cohomology groups are somehow defined as cohomology groups of a complex whose terms are these differential forms. Um, this has to degenerate at the first page just because if there were any non-trivial differentials, uh, then the dimension of this would have to be strictly smaller than the dimension of all of the things that contribute here at the first page. But on the other hand, the sum of all those dimensions is the dimension of the singular cohomology with complex coefficients in those cases. And so as the dimensions agree, uh, the spectral sequence has to degenerate. All right. And so uh, let's discuss some examples. So uh, the first example that I probably care most about as an algebraic geometer is that all projective smooth algebraic varieties can be considered as Kähler complex manifolds. So there's a natural Kähler form on projective space, and you can restrict this to any sub-variety and get a Kähler form there. And well, it gives you examples. Um, but I also want to discuss some uh, examples which are not algebraic, and in particular, I want to discuss some non kähler examples. That's why maybe I should also say that uh, you can, even if it's not projective but just proper, some consequences are still true. For example, there's still some Hodge decomposition proved by Deline and the hodge durand spectral sequence still degenerates. So for everything that comes from algebraic geometry, the results I just stated are still true. <coughs> so this, so to see examples where they fail, we would have to go to some non kähler complex manifolds, which are also non-algebraic. And I wanted to discuss two of them. So the first example is what's called the Hopf surface. So it's a complex surface, so as a real manifold, it will be four-dimensional. And so the formula is the following. So you pick some complex number, convertible complex number of absolute value less than one. <clears throat> and then what you do is kind of similar to uh, the uniformization of a complex elliptic curve by the C star, mapping by the exponential map somewhat to it, um, where the kernel is some Q to the Z. But now you do this one dimension higher. So you take a two-dimensional complex plane remove the origin, and then you can let this number Q act diagonally on the complex numbers. And so this is a totally discontinuous action, so you can take the quotient, and the quotient will turn out to be a compact complex manifold then. And so I claim that this is not Kähler, and one way to see this is to observe that uh, one can compute some of the Hodge cohomology groups. Um, one can compute that the first cohomology of the structure sheaf are just complex numbers, while there are no global differential forms on X. Um, and so I claim that what's called Hodge symmetry fails. So Hodge symmetry is a statement that's a dimension of the HI of omega J and the HJ of omega I. So in this case, it would be H1 of omega naught, which is just O, and H naught of omega 1. That their dimensions are always the same so that follows from something I didn't say about the Hodge decomposition that, <coughs> oh, maybe I can go back to this actually. So, oops. Um, if you look at this Hodge decomposition here, then there's a natural complex conjugation on the left-hand side because it's not a real structure, even an integral structure. And if you take the complex conjugate of such a subspace here, then you get the subspace where you interchange J and I minus J. So in particular, they need to have the same dimension. And so uh, this equality of dimension fails here, so this can't be Kähler. Um, however, the hodge to durand spectral sequence, if you compute it, actually still degenerates. 
So let's try to find an example where it doesn't. And so that's given by the so-called Iwasawa threefold, I think the first example, where we don't have degeneration of the spectral sequence. So for this, you look at a unitopotent subgroup of the three by three matrices. <coughs> And then you can look at the quotient of the complex points by the points in some lattice inside the complex numbers, say Z adjoin I. <coughs> so what kind of object is this? So if you, uh, you, get, you can project to a smaller object if you forget some of the star in the upper right corner, then this N is just a direct sum of two copies of the additive group. And so this gives you a projection from this X to two copies of the complex numbers modulo z adjoin i, so that's the complex numbers modulo z adjoin i, that's an elliptic curve of the complex numbers, which even is complex multiplication. And so this projects onto an abelian surface. And <coughs> the fi each fiber over this abelian surface, each fiber will again be the same CM elliptic curve. However, it's some kind of twisted form of this elliptic curve over this abelian surface. <coughs> And this twist that you get there somehow introduces a non-trivial differential in the uh, Hodge-Durham spectral sequence. And you can verify that the, the spectral sequence does indeed not gener degenerate at E1, which then implies that this X is not, not clear. Okay. And so I think that's what I wanted to say about complex Hodge theory. So let's... Uh, I didn't look them up and I, I don't want to do computation on my head. <laughs> um, so let me discuss Pierre de Koch theory. So Pierre de Koch theory uh, is about getting analogs of these results if you don't consider manifolds of the complex numbers but manifolds of the periodic numbers. And so I will fix some periodic field. And I think you don't really lose any, any generality, much of generality, if you just think it's QP itself and all that follows. But you could consider any discretely valued complete extension of QP. What's a bit critical is that the residue field is, is a perfect field of characteristics. So in particular, any finite extension of QP would be as good. Or somewhere in this generality, you can somehow take the width vectors of this perfect residue field, invert P, that's some, uh, the absolutely unramified example of such a thing, and then this K must be a finite extension there. <coughs> and then, so in some sense, this is maybe the analog of the real numbers. Maybe, but I'm a lot of finite extensions, so the complex numbers would be as good. But um, what's very different in the periodic case as, uh, as compared to the complex case is that if you pass to the algebraic closure of this, um, of this field, then this is of infinite degree over the base field. Uh, just because you can somehow <coughs> take P, roots of the uniformizer, arbitrary large roots of the uniformizer, and these will somehow always be new elements. And so this has the result that if you just take the algebraic closure, it will not be complete anymore. And so if you want to do some analysis, it's better to work with complete fields. And so let's just again take the completion, and then it's an old lemma of Krasner that the resulting thing is still algebraically closed, at least. So what you get here is some complete algebraically closed field uh, containing QP. And if I would have taken this to be a finite extension of QP, I guess this is usually called CP. So the bold phase C because it's considered a periodic analog of the complex numbers. And so I want to start my discussion of Felix Koch theory with a celebrated theorem of Tate from his Peter Visible Groups paper from 1967, which I think was the first result in Peter Koch theory. <coughs> And so for this, uh, I consider, ah, this should, okay. So I consider the ring of integers OK, where this should be a capital K here. 
uh, of, of my fields. Okay, so if this was QP, this okay would be ZP. So I someone considers a good reduction case. So considering a beam variety over this. So I guess it's the same result I'm about to state would also work if you consider a proper smooth curve over the ring of integers. Oh. So this proper smooth curve would have associated to be a uh, Jacobian and all the cohomological, uh, well, not quite. Yeah, all the cohomological things I'm going to write down are the same for, for this curve and it's Jacobian. Well, that happens if you change notation in your slides in the last minute. So I used to call this, ah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Everything here is capital K. I'm sorry. So they, at one point in my slides, they had a little K here, and then the residue field was called kappa, but then I thought, because I wanted to reserve the capital K for something else, but then I realized I never need this capital K, and I thought it's better to revert to this way, but then I should have done this better. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, so then there's some kind of Hodge decomposition. So you take the it's hard, and also write x instead of a. Oh my god. Um, x is equal to a. <laughs> <clears throat> I hope there will not be as many typos in the remaining slides. Um, all right. Okay, so you have um, so the generic fiber of x. So it's some um, BM variety over well, over k, but then you can also take pass to, so some if you want to talk, you can talk homology, it's maybe better to pass to some algebraic closed base field. And so then this is some of the analog of singular cohomology of, that we had in the complex Hodge series setup. And then, <clears throat> so in the complex Hodge series setup, we extended scalars to our field complex numbers, and so we do the same here. And then again, we get some, uh, uh, some kind of Hodge decomposition. So it's a direct sum of um, the corresponding Hodge cohomology groups. So it's the H1 of O. Um, because my X only lived over this field K, um, and I want to compare with some C vector space, I better also extend scalars on the other side now. This wasn't necessary in the complex case because yeah, this was already the complex vector space. And so I do the same here. But there's a strange minus one I had put in here. That's a T twist. So it changes the Galois action. Uh, on this bit. And so if you change the scalar action in this way, uh, so you twist by the inverse of the cyclotomic character here, like the action on the p power roots of unity, uh, then the resulting isomorphism will be equivariant with respect to the action of the absolute Galois group of k, which you certainly have on the Tarkov homology because you somehow act on this field c. Um, on the right hand side, this k vector space here is supposed to have, so there's a trivial, well, this has a trivial action of the Galois group. The Galois group again acts on this field C, and here it acts on C and some of the take twist. Um, so this is interesting because it gives some analog of this very interesting Hodgkin composition over the periodic numbers, but it's also interesting because it actually gives non-trivial information about how the Galois group acts um, on the Etat homology. And so this kind of knowledge about how the Galois group acts turns out to be extremely important in many applications in arithmetic. So the reason you didn't write H1 XP or XP on the right is to emphasize <coughs> the large consumption of Right, 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 right. Hmm? Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, Okay, and so pretty much directly after stating this result, uh, Tate made a conjecture, maybe, I mean, it was a question. Oh. Uh, so he asked the following. One can ask whether a similar Hodge-like decomposition exists for the Tarkov homology with values in C, so meaning so this gadget here where now I allow more general X. 
uh, in all dimensions, so meaning not just uh, for the H1, but for all higher HIs as well. Um, for a scheme X over the complex numbers, and then he somehow wondered what kind of X is allowed here. So he proved this if you have an abelian variety over the ring of integers, and so <coughs> uh, the first Milo's generalization maybe of this would be if you take any projective smooth scheme over the ring of integers. Um, but maybe some of all the data that we needed to formulate this result, they only depended on the thing over the generic fiber. So maybe it's enough to have just a projective smooth scheme over, over this periodic field, so which may have a bad reduction. And he even asked whether a similar thing could hold true for suitable rigid analytic spaces. So I guess as well at the time when rigid analytic spaces were, weren't even publicly defined. Um, and I guess in, because uh, the analogous story over the complex numbers really works <coughs> in the setup of complex manifolds, at least scalar ones, it's a very reasonable question to ask whether something similar could be true. Uh, in the original analytic ca case, and maybe one could even wonder whether it's more natural to prove it using analytic techniques because over the complex numbers, some of analytic techniques were absolutely essential in establishing the Hodge decomposition. <clears throat> I should also say that that's what he calls the Hodge like decomposition here, is what we now call a Hodge Tate decomposition. <clears throat> And so let me discuss some results that uh, were proved. So I think the first result was by Fontaine and Messing in, I think, 1985. And so they considered the first case mentioned by Tate, where you really have a projected smooth scheme over the ring of integers of your periodic field. And they are most roughly in the, Z, in the case where there is no ramification. So it's really ZP and not ZP adjoin a root of P or something. Uh, they needed this for their methods, and they needed to assume that the prime they're considering is, I'm not sure I get the exact inequality right, but roughly larger than the dimension of X. So, <coughs> um, they did this by actually establishing a stronger result. They actually proved in modern language that the Etat homology of this guy, of the genetic fiber of this guy, is what we call a crystalline Galois representation. So crystalline is much stronger than being Hodge-Tate. And if you have something crystalline, <coughs> then there are some associated crystalline cohomology groups roughly. And if you do this to the generic fiber here, then you get the crystalline cohomology group of the special fiber. So you get this comparison between a tall and crystalline cohomology. <coughs> and then the next result uh, was due to faultings, where it proved the Hodge-Tate decomposition for any proper smooth scheme over the periodic field uh, with no further assumptions. So Fartings completely resolved the algebraic case of, um, of Tate's question. <clears throat> and so uh, my talks actually will be very much based on this proof given by Fartings in 1990. So we'll follow the same kind of strategy for proving this. Um, other proofs were given by Tsuji, Niziol, and Valensen. Um, but all of them were only uh, for algebraic varieties. And okay, you could also consider some generalizations where maybe it's not proper anymore, or maybe there are some singularities at the boundary or somewhere. And um, uh, all such variants were somehow established by 2001 and, or two, by Tsuji and Fouting. Um, however, the rigid analytic case that was already considered by Tate uh, remained completely open. And one reason some, uh, one couldn't really hope to say much was that some of one critical object in the such state composition is, of course, this Pieta guitar cohomology of, uh, of this generic fiber. 
But uh, for a general rigid analytic variety, one did not even know that this was a finitely generated ZP module. So again, it was a complex number, so it was kind of obvious because you could cover your space by open pulley disks and then uh, use this to compute singular cohomology because the cohomology of pulley disks is so simple. It's just easy. Um, so I want to, the PID case, <coughs> the local structure of algebraic varieties is much more complicated because you somehow have <coughs> many finite detail covers even over just the generic point. The generic point has its, itself still an absolute governor group, which is very big, which means that there are still lots of finite detail covers. So you don't have some local contractibility result. You I will assume properness in a second, yes. Um, all right. Um, so before coming to results, let for the results, let me um, discuss to what extent the examples I gave in the complex case uh, also work in the periodic case. Uh, so okay. So in the following, I want to consider as x some proper smooth uh, rich analytic variety over it. Okay. So that's some of the periodic analog of a compact complex manifold. So if you take a translator from complex geometry to periodic geometry and you put in complex complex manifold, this, this term will spit out. Um, and so examples for this would be, you can, you can take something algebraic, so some proper smooth scheme over it, and then you can pass to some, to some analytification functor and get uh, subjugated. So algebraic guys are still in the picture. And so let's try to look at our non-algebraic examples. So this was the soft surface and the Iwasawa threefold. Ah, oh, ah, sorry. First, some other examples, interesting examples maybe. Um, so some other thing you can do is you can t start with some proper smooth scheme over the residue field. So for interesting examples might be in a BM variety or a K3 surface. And so for these guys, it's known that there are some formal deformations which are not algebraizable, at least if you're not maybe an elliptic curve. Um, and so if you take such a non-algebraic deformation, it gives you some formal scheme of the ring of integers, and then its generic fiber will be an example of such a guy. So they fall, fall into uh, this. But they're still some, uh, they feel like they're still close to algebraic geometry. Uh, but they're, but you also have the soft surface, which is some more distant. Um, so, you can define this in ex actually exactly the same way. So you take some invertible number in your base field of absolute value less than one. So here, of course, the absolute value is now the periodic absolute value. So you could take for Q the number P, say. And then <coughs> uh, well, maybe this is base change of, of what I really want to the complex numbers. But, um, so you take the two-dimensional affine plane, so depicted by your C squared here again, remove the origin and divide by the diagonal action of Q to the Z. So dividing by such a diagonal action would be a bad thing in, in algebraic geometry because it would not be totally discontinuous. But in this periodic analytic world, it's again a totally discontinuous map. And you can pass to the quotient and it will turn out to be you know, something <coughs> proper, meaning somewhat compact in the intuitive sense. And so this means that some of Eric Maybe we don't know what it would mean for original to write to, to be Kähler, but certainly this example this should not be Kähler, whatever it should mean. Um, so, and again, one reason it should not be Kähler is that you can again compute the Hodge cohomology groups of this, and they turn out to be the same as in the complex case. And so Hodge symmetry will again fail for, for this example. However, you cannot form a periodic analog of the Iwasawa manifold. So why is that? Um, so in the complex case, we took the complex numbers, and we used crucially that there are some co-compact discrete subgroups like the join I. <coughs> but uh, the periodic numbers, they don't have any such co-compact discrete subgroups. In fact, they have no discrete subgroups at all because <clears throat> so if you look at the subgroup generated by the number one inside of this periodic thing, 
Um, then somehow it contains all the p powers, p to the n. But the p powers p to the n and the periodic topology, they go to zero. And so in any open neighborhood of zero, big enough p powers will live in, and so this can't be a discrete subgroup. So there are no discrete subgroups uh, of this field in the periodic case, and so uh, you don't really know what you should divide out by to try to mimic the Vazava manifold example in the periodic case. And so let me also state the following theorem. So recall that uh, X was this proper smooth rigid analytic variety over this perfect field. So the first result is that indeed this finiteness is true and Recall that here I did assume that X is proper, and I will say that this is really important in a second. Um, so these etat cohomology groups of X, they are finally generated the P modules, and so on the complex case, they were zero if I is larger than the real dimension, so for topological reasons, and so the real dimension was twice the complex dimension, and so similarly here, there's no real dimension of a periodic manifold. There's somewhat just the analog of the complex dimension. And so there are zero of i is larger than twice the dimension. There's a question. There's a question. Yes. Yeah, so in the complex analytic case, you would want to um, avoid things like uh, Riemann Peterson things in the genome. So is there something or not? I mean, in the open case? In the open case. No, I mean, it's, 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 much, it's much worse in the, as I will explain in a second, it's much worse this, fi this failure of finiteness in the periodic case. Um, it's, it just doesn't come, it's not necessary to have some infinite genus surface somehow. Just the disk is already a context. <laughs> uh, um, there's something funny about this result, namely, um, some of the proof, I mean, the proof somehow can't rely, on why does there this two here? I mean, in the complex case, it was because the complex numbers are two-dimensional with real numbers. But here we are in a purely periodic setup, so, we can't in any way, this two can't in any way come up because the complex numbers are two-dimensional with the real numbers. It must come up in some completely separate way, but it comes up again. <coughs> um, huh, here there are no typos in the statement, wonderful. Uh, uh, so you do have a Hodge decomposition now, so oh, I guess this is a precise analog of what uh, Tate had proved. So you take the Tarkov homology groups now then there's an up to the, the periodic analog of the complex numbers. And then it's a direct sum of these Hodge cohomology groups extend, extended to C. And for omega j, you somehow have to put in the state with minus j to make this scholar like invariant. Um, in number one, this is true for any proper guy, actually, because of resolution of singularities, which you know for this setup. Uh, I will have to think about it. I think using resolution of singularities again, you can, should probably be able to prove. By the way, how does this work in the complex case? No, no, sorry. I mean, whatever you expect to be true, uh, some of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah. Let me stick to the smooth case. I mean, I think one, using resolution of singularities, which is known for uh, rigid analytic varieties over periodic fields, uh, you can <coughs> get beyond that, but. Uh, I mean, there are some kind of periodic Hodge structures which are probably the analog of that. And some of the interesting things in the periodic case is that some of all the information is actually seen in the etat cohomology of this Galois action. So you don't need anything beyond that. Um, no, no, no. It's really direct sum as uh, this Galois module. Hmm? Right, right. Uh, the question was whether the Galois action makes this the direct summons on the right hand side and it doesn't and he said rightly so that this may be different than the complex case because the Delin torus which is probably the analog of the Galois action in the complex case would mix those uh, uh, is that right uh, and so again a formal consequence of the f uh, sorry uh, Ah. Here you see the potential product of the two. It's still a fact. 
So the common was that uh, you can consider two Galois actions on the left-hand side. One, the one which I consider is uh, where somehow I act on both, both factors of the tensor product. But you could also just act on the right, and then this would give some action which pro does not preserve these things. And you said that's more analogous to the, yeah. to the complex case. Okay. Uh, right? Um, so uh, over the complex numbers, I stated this. Uh, the wrong comparison, which in that case was extremely simple, uh, just relying on this holomorphic Poincare lemma. Um, that part is actually much more subtle in the periodic case. Uh, and it uses crucially this, uh, this ring of periodic periods B to ROM, this field of periodic periods B to ROM introduced by Fontaine. Uh, so this is a the fraction field of a complete discrete valuation ring whose residue field is C. So it's like something like Z Laurent series and an additional variable. So it's like one dimension bigger than what you would maybe expect. Um, but one knows that it's really necessary uh, if you want to have a comparison between a tall cohomology group extended to some kind of period field and the Ram cohomology extended to some period field. Um, Abstractly, it's isomorphic to a Laurent uh, series field over C. So that same C. Uh, that same C, but not canonically so. Um, uh, so that's called the Drum comparison isomorphism because it's a comparison between the Tarkov homology and the Drum homology. So this round cohomology is again defined in the same way as the hypercohomology of some complex formed from the differential forms. Um, usually one also wants that this preserves filtrations and it does. So there's a Hodge filtration on the round cohomology and uh, because this is some, uh, some Laurent series field it somehow has a natural filtration by, <coughs> by powers of the valuation, by powers of the there's some T to the i times the power series ring. Um, so this has some kind of tensor product filtration and this is supposed to sit in one filtered piece and then the filtration only comes from this part. So the consequence of this is again effect about the Galois action on the Etar homology. It says that the Galois action on this Etar homology group is, is what Fontaine calls the RAM. So it means that there are just to say a word about what this means. So on the right hand side, there are some Galois invariants, namely the Durham homology itself is Galois invariant. So because we have put the trivial Galois action here. And so this means that there are some Galois invariants on the left hand side. And, but for a generic Galois representation, if you tensor with this field, this would not have any Galois invariants at all. And so what Durham means is that there are enough Galois invariants in this tensor product here. Again, yeah, it gives some interesting arithmetic information about this, this Galois action. Which is stronger than what you get from such a state composition. <coughs> and now, actually, again, a purely formal consequence of those two results is that if you look at the hodge Durham spectral sequence, then it needs to degenerate at the first page. Why? So again, we just compute dimensions. So if you sum up the hodge cohomology groups, then by the hodge tatic composition, the sum of the dimension of the hodge cohomology groups, is a dimension of a tau cohomology with, Q, with C coefficients, or with QP coefficients. <coughs> but, uh, well again, we turn up to some field here, so that has the same dimension. And so this has the same dimension, so the same dimension as the wrong cohomology, and so, from this comparison of dimensions, you see that the hodge durham spectral sequence must degenerate at E1. And note that we didn't put any analog of a Keter assumption anywhere. So uh, it's good that we weren't able to produce an example of the Iwasawa threefold. Um, and it's good that for the soft surface, incidentally, somehow from the complex picture, from the, pic from the picture, it looks like it's an incident that the hopped surface but the Hopf surface, the uh, hodge ram spectral sequence degenerates, but in the periodic case, it's somehow, it must be true. <coughs> OK.
Okay, so the first thing I want to do, so I guess what I want to do in uh, the first two talks is sketch the proof of part one and two of this theorem. The finiteness of cohomology and then as a such thing different division. All right, and so the first thing I want to discuss is uh, to what extent one can believe uh, such a finiteness statement. Um, so I guess what one more often considers is LLA cohomology. If you're somewhere in a situation where P is roughly the characteristic, you better take LLA cohomology usually, but here we want P to cohomology. But um, if you do LLA cohomology for L not equal to P, then this was known by work of Berkovich and Huber. I mean, I guess, I guess I gave independent proofs of this. And um, let me briefly sketch the idea there. So it's known that any rigid analytical variety admits some formal model. Um, that's a statement of Renault. Uh, so meaning a formal scheme of the ring of integers of your periodic field whose generic fiber is some of this rigid analytic variety. And <clears throat> then one way to compute cohomology is somehow first to look at the nearby cycles, which somehow at each point in the special fiber see the cohomology of all points specializing to this point, <clears throat> and then take cohomology of, of the resulting nearby cycles on the special fiber. And uh, from more classical results, it was known that, which one maybe had to improve a bit in order to apply it in the switch in the case, but one, one knows that nearby cycles, if L is somehow different from all intervening characteristics, uh, in particular from the residue characteristic, that they, these, they will preserve finiteness to some constructability. And then if you have some constructible sheaf on the special fiber, uh, then one also knows that its cohomology is finite. And so putting those ingredients together, you get this desired finiteness result. And uh, again, this should be a capital K. Um, I mean, this works without properness. Uh, I guess I put some adjectives here to know for sure that what I'm stating is correct, but I think you could even weaken this. In any case, some, it also, it's also true just for a disk. Because the disk has a tau cohomology, as you would expect, only in degree zero, where, where it's just ZL. <clears throat> in particular, some, uh, roughly what you do here is you try to prove a global finiteness result, <clears throat> as in the complex case, by first proving a local finiteness result, and then patching this together. And in the complex case, the local finiteness result was extremely easy because locally it was just a poly disk, which was contractible. In the periodic case, the local finiteness result for LLA cohomology is a bit harder, but still true. And of course, being able to localize uh, is of much help usually. Uh, but this method does not at all work if L is equal to P. In fact, if X is just a closed unit disk over K, which is probably the simplest example you can ever think of, such a variety, uh, then the first etal cohomology group is with FP coefficients, but then also with ZP coefficients. Um, but I want to say that already someone's, what's probably the simpler case, FP, it's infinite dimensional. Um, and it also, I mean, usually you want your etal cohomology groups to be independent of the choice of base field. But here, these cohomology groups, they will really critically depend on the choice of the space field C. <clears throat> and this is infinite dimensional because a similar thing characteristic P is infinite dimensional. So if you look at, no, this is not a typo. I really want the F on line over the residue field here. Um, so if you look at the F on line over the algebraic closure of the residue field uh, with FP coefficients, then you know that this H1 is infinite dimensional because this A1 has lots of finite covers coming from these Artin Schreier covers. And uh, what precisely you get is also related to the, which residue field here you have. So if you increase this residue field, um, <clears throat> you will get an even larger infinite dimensional space. And so you can show that this infinite dimensional space embeds into this space, so this has to be infinite dimensional as well. So roughly what you do is you have a form model of this closed unit disk, which in the special fiber is the affine line. And so if you have an etal cover of the affine line, um, then you can extend this by unique lifting of finite etal covers with infinitesimals. 
uh, to the form model and then takes a generic fiber which gives you a finite detail cover of the generic fiber. Or said differently, somehow if you take the nearby cycles of FP, then they will contain at least this copy of FP on the special fiber. And already there, somehow on the special fiber, you have this failure of finiteness. <coughs> So this tells us that we really need some kind of global argument um, using, so these Artin Schreier covers, they're infinite dimensional because coherent cohomology is not fin finite on something affine. But coherent cohomology is finite if you're in the proper situation. So the idea is that if you're in the proper situation, then we have some hope that something like coherent cohomology is finite. And uh, this way we can control these Artin Schreier type covers. The problem with uh, this approach is that the artin schreier sequence is something which is really in characteristic P, uh, but we want to prove something in characteristic zero. <coughs> um, actually, what's the time? Okay. So let me talk about the local structure of rigid knowledge varieties. So as I said, complex manifolds are locally contractible. In contrast, rigid analytic varieties have a large fundamental group in general, um, as I said, and even locally, somehow you can't make them small by restricting to open subsets. <coughs> However, what's good is that at least they have no higher homotopy groups. In the following sense, um, so rigid analytic varieties are built from so-called affinoid uh, spaces in the, in the same way as schemes are built from affine schemes. And so let's take some such basic building block here, which let's assume is connected. Um, then actually it's a K pi one, uh, meaning intuitively that it just has a pi one. Um, at least if you are only interested in the P torsion coefficient. So the precise statement I mean is that uh, for all P torsion local systems on the space X, you can compute the Tarkov homology of X by pretending uh, that X only had it's pi one, and if it only had its pi one, then some of this should be driven by group cohomology. Um, and so that's what turns out to be true. So this pi one here is a profinite group, so you can consider the continuous group cohomology acting on uh, the fiber of this sheaf L, and uh, there is a log. So here X is some geometric base point, and this is a profinite talk meaning it's some of the thing that Clesfus discrete whose discrete sets on which they act they correspond to finite talk covers of this thing. So let me briefly sketch in the remaining time the proof of this result. So let me first explain that this is easy if you uh, replace our periodic field by the analog and characteristic P of this, so by such a Laurent series field and maybe completion of an algebraic closure of that again. Um, in that case, it's much easier precisely because we have this Artin Schreier sequence. So, to prove the statement, turns out to be enough actually to consider coefficients fp. And then we have this Artin Schreier sequence. Uh, fp sits inside of OX, and then this map x goes to x to the p minus x, uh, which is an exact sequence of sheaves on the etal side. And if we have some kind of a phenoid space and the coherent cohomology vanishes in positive degrees. And so if you look at the associated long exact sequence, we see that the Etat cohomology groups of FP need to vanish for I at least two. And so we just have an H0 and an H1. And so they're computed by a simple long exact sequence of so long. Uh, where two times we have here the global sections of the structure sheaf. And this map here is this map X goes to the X to the P minus <clears throat> and so we can also try to compute the right hand side as continuous group cohomology and <clears throat> well the critical observation is that in order to get this exactness of the artin schreier sequence you actually only need to find pass to finite tar covers because somehow to solve the equation x to p minus x is equal to some given function that somehow gives you a finite tar cover or which there's a tautological solution and so this means that uh, you actually get by the very same computation the same result with these continuous group cohomology groups. And so this proves the result in characteristic P. And so in our, so the idea is to reduce to this uh, result in characteristic P. Well, what's the, can you repeat the 
So you can also consider some of the finite etal side of X where you only allow finite etal covers. So cohomology on that side precisely computes this continuous group cohomology by some abstract result. And this sequence here is also exact on the finite etal side. Because in order to get surjectivity of this Artin-Schweier map here, you need to solve some equations x to the p minus x is equal to some given function f, but this defines the finite etal cover of your space. <coughs> so now let's do, we'll try to do this k pi 1 mixed characteristic. And so we want to reduce to the case of equal characteristic, and so for this I use perfectoid spaces, and which I will recall in the next lecture in more detail. But let me just very briefly say how I'm going to use them. Because I think it's a, it, it illustrates very well how they are used to get information about these periodic spaces. Um, uh, so I will give this definition again tomorrow. So let me be a bit brief about it today. Um, so perfectoid spaces are <coughs> built from some kind of uh, topological algebras, as are somewhat usual in some analytic geometry. But they are of the more unusual kind in that you assume that you have lots of p-power roots in them, which is somehow encoded in the statement that if you look at the integral elements in your ring, mod, you can mod this out by p, so that's something like the ring of integers of k mod p, and you require that Frobenius is surjective, which will never be the case for usual finite type algebra. Um, and I will give examples, etc., tomorrow. Um, <clears throat> I will also use this field uh, called C flat, which I will also again recall tomorrow, um, which is some field which is canonically built from this algebraically closed field in characteristic zero by some functorial process. But what you get in the end turns out to be this kind of equal characteristic version that I've just talked about um, of the field C. So it's a characteristic P field, again, algebraically closed and complete. And so you can give the same definition of the perfect algebra in this other setup. And the surprising result is that this category of characteristic zero algebras is canonically equivalent to the, to the category of characteristic P algebras. So there's some canonical functor, which is an equivalence of categories between some stuff in characteristic zero and characteristic P. And I will recall all this tomorrow. Um, you can again associate some kind of rigid analytic varieties to these gadgets, which is then called a finite perfectoid spaces. And then because the algebras are equivalent, also the spaces are equivalent. And so the functor is denoted somewhat in the same way that the space X in characteristic zero is mapped to the so-called tilt in characteristic P. And the crucial result I want to use is that <coughs> this process preserves all topological information more precisely those of these objects have their own intrinsic etal side, but <clears throat> their etal sides are canonically equivalent. So if you have any space Y over X, which is etal, then its tilt will also be etal over X tilt. And this turns out to be an equivalence of categories. So this means that we can transport this topological information completely into characteristic P. And maybe I'll also recall briefly, already today, the functor so it's the same Fontaine construction. So you, it's again some, we can write down this functor. It looks a bit weird. But some, some this, this construction was known for a very long time in periodic consciousness. <clears throat> and so, yes? What does not, uh, well, all topological information passes from characteristic zero to characteristic P, but all coherent information doesn't. That's the rough picture. So of course, the module categories can't be equivalent because the module category in characteristic zero must be a Q linear category. The module, characteristic, module category in characteristic P is a P linear. They can't be equivalent. Somehow, the reason that these can be equivalent is that some algebras are not linear over anything. Only modules are linear. All right, so let me end by uh, explaining the proof of this result on k pi 1. So we want to prove that any such rigid analytic variety over C is a k pi 1. 
And so what you can always do, you can always find some perfectoid space sitting over it, which is some kind of inverse limit of finitely tall covers. Namely, in characteristic zero, you can always adjoin a p-power root of some element, of some unit. And this will be a finitely tall cover in characteristic zero, because extracting p-power roots of unit, units is some finitely tall operation in characteristic zero. And this way, you can some way join lots of p-power roots of elements. And recall that being perfectoid just was a condition that there are, in some sense, lots of p-power roots of elements. And so by iterating this procedure, you always get something perfectoid. Well, as I said, it's a statement that etar cohomology groups of local systems can be computed in terms of uh, continuous group cohomology. Um, so, um, so now that we have this perfectoid space x tilde, we can pass to its tilde. So the tilde is a, some affinoid space and equal characteristic. And so maybe we didn't run the previous argument in this generality of perfectoid space, but it works exactly the same there. So it's this guy in characteristic P by this Artin Schreier argument must be a K pi 1. What is X hmm? uh, This thing? Yeah. That's the tilt. That's, uh, well, if we have perfectoid space in characteristic 0, I can pass to its tilt, which is characteristic P. And I apply this to this infinite covering space of my X. So some of the issue was that uh, rich analytic varieties have lots of coverings still locally, but now we somehow put them all into this X tilde here. So the tilde is now something characteristic P for which we know it's a K pi 1. But all the topological information is precisely the same as the two setups. So this means as a K pi, being a K pi 1 is some topological property. This passes to characteristic 0. So this X tilde, this infinite covering of X, will also be a K pi 1. But on the other hand, to construct this X tilde, we only took finite etar covers. So some of we only changed the pi 1, we didn't change the higher homotopy groups. And so as this covering is pro finite etar cover, also the thing on the basis X has to be a K pi 1 for P torsion coefficients. So that's the general strategy of using this perfectoid machinery, which, which I will recall in the next talk, that we pass to some infinite covering space uh, which is a perfectoid space, and then relate this to characteristic P where you can get additional information using uh, things that are only available in characteristic P such as this Artin trial cover. Correct. Yeah, maybe they are less rich than. Repeat the ah, sorry, repeat the question. Uh, so the question was whether the fact that we always get degeneration at E1 of the sort of spectral sequence indicates that rich analytic varieties are not sufficiently rich. And uh, well, I think they are not as rich as complex analytic. I mean, it's complex manifolds. Um, but. Uh, <laughs>